And now, Joe, B Joe Benton will talk to us about dealing with life as a formerly incarcerated person. Here's Behind the Walls. Thank you very much. I, I rise here today to speak about the torturous behaviors or the torturous conduct, not only of the correctional officers, but that prison environment. But my journey didn't start serving a life sentence. It started as a six-year-old boy who was sexually abused. And that haunted me throughout my life, and I became extremely violent. But in spite of that, I wound up in prison. And I was locked in a room where the lights were on 24 hours a day. I couldn't tell whether it was daylight. I couldn't tell the time of day. This was some of the most torturous abuses that I could imagine. I didn't realize at that time, because of this abuse as a child that haunted me, I wanted to be tough because I never wanted to be abused again. So whatever they threw at me, I was prepared to deal with. And that's one of the reasons why I was violent, because anytime a man approached me the way I was approached, I became, from therapy, they tell me that's my protector self. And that protective self would emerge, and I would have these exchanges. But those exchanges verbally caused me to be locked in segregation for such a long time. As a result of that, and after my release, I found myself standing on a corner crying because I didn't know how to readjust. How, how was I going to make it? after spending all these years incarcerated. There was no programs in place to help me step down or to work me through my psychiatric problems. I've been in therapy now for almost 20 years. That's how I learned about my defender self. And I, instead of burying those assaults on that six-year-old boy, I, I processed through it and I hugged that boy to let him know that it's okay today. So I don't have to be abusive. But there are more people like me who I thank God for anointing me to proclaim a different approach. And that is for me not to cry and be sorrowful, but to get out here and help those who are similarly situated. And I cry when I see people sit on Broad Street lost with no sense of direction, when there's programs that should be available to them. Now, I'm not going to talk a long time, but I want to just conclude by saying there's a restrictive housing act before the legislature. And this act is to reduce the amount of time you spend in solitary confinement. How? does a person come out here and be sane? Yes. And I also asked the question, why is the recidivism rate so high? It's because of what the damage that you do to the people that are there. And this injustice has to stop. They deny, they deny, they deny. The current prison, prison director says all these colorful things that there's no problems in that prison. There's no COVID there. But she won't go in that prison. She won't walk to put a, she won't step one foot there. Three inmates have died from COVID and one correctional officer. Now there's two because my nephew who was a correctional officer, we just buried him about three weeks ago. Medical and psychiatric programs are are totally non-existent in that environment. So I just want to say, I thank God for therapy. And I thank God for the times that I pray and I cry, God, make me a better person. I don't want to be violent with nobody. I just want to help somebody, poor people like me. I just want to reach out. 
So if you look for me, I'll probably be down in the courthouse passing out water or coffee or donuts, talking to guys who are getting out of prison on bail or being released. I want to hug them and say it's going to be all right. This is what you can do to preserve your sanity. So I'll get ready to close. But the hardest thing for me was when my daughter ran up behind me and grabbed me, I was stopped. I didn't, I, I, have, I had to learn to accept her warm embrace. That six year old boy, I struggle with him. So God bless you. And I thank you for, uh, for letting me speak. I thank you very much. God, I wish you bless you. Thank you, Joe.